which are targeted specifically at schools. Schools can access it um, through TKI, that would be so to Kete Purangi. So that's the quick and easy answer to that. Much bigger question. Thoughts from this end of the table? Just so I don't, I'm not no. from a library specifically. Um, I'm Richard. Um, I'm just wondering what are people doing to move more on the citizenship aspect than mm -hmm. the digital bit? Because yep. the digital is you know, providing the access yep. and the means. Uh, how, how are people encouraging children to, and young learners to think about that and merely the digital is simply a, a pathway to improve their participation? Right, so... Is there any thoughts? Or? Yeah, I mean, I know that some, one of the things that's happening in some schools is actually setting up children with experiences of their own agency in respect of a, a community yeah. mm -hmm. initiative. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a school teacher and she was talking about um, and it was something about the, was something about the way that the local park was managed right. and they actually wrote yeah. to the local park keeper and then ultimately to the next person in the chain in order to find out where did where did their agency work and it was about they wanted a, I think it was a, a windbreak or something mm -hmm. and so they she, she'd actually done some prior work to work out whether it would be possible mm -hmm. and she kind of got an indication that they would be willing to hear the children so it was sort of yeah, so some yeah. of it, I mean, sometimes you do need to set it up. It's that idea that I was I talked yeah. about about authentic learning. So you're actually for a reason. You're, do, you're doing things for a reason. Um, I'm thinking of a school I've worked with locally who were wanting to petition the council about uh, dropping the speed limit outside their school because they are slightly on the fringe of the city, and so the speed limit past the gate is an eye-watering 70 kilometres an hour, which is very quick when you're five and mum is on the other side of the road. So, so it's, I think it's setting students up with both the skills but also the confidence and the understanding of the way, way local government works, the way structures are in place that we, that we can actually have a say. So a lot of it's about empowering as well, so we're developing or helping raise a, a generation of people who are actually comfortable participating yeah. in the, the government and organisation of their communities. Providing, providing that empowerment translates into their personal lives. Absolutely. So, um, for example, NetSafe mm -hmm. is available at schools perhaps, yep. but when you go home, if parents don't have NetSafe and things like that, that sort of discernment and um, mm -hmm. ability to be able to, as a, as a child, say, no, this isn't yep. right, I shouldn't be seeing this. Mm -hmm. or, um, and, and also the things where you focus on education and schools for the learning experience, but translating that into personal life yep. as well. So the transfer is tricky. One, one aspect that I didn't mention but does come through quite strongly is the, the whole idea of providing education for um, family and community members as well. It's, it's insufficient to simply focus on the students in your school. Um, there's an, an upskilling or an awareness raising that's necessary for mums and dads and caregivers. So that, again, so that we're all giving the same message. And that, yeah, and that's why I'm sort of trying to get at before because if you think about um, the facilities, for instance, you know, schools predominantly are open from 8 30 or 9 till whenever, and that's where I think there could, there could be some amazing opportunities to work far more closely with public libraries because yep. at the end of the day, most of us are seven day a week operations these days. So, you know, so there's opportunities. Yeah. Yep. And opportunities I get, and I guess that's, that's also that parent awareness as well. So mm. parents actually understand what's available. Um, well, I mean, there's a whole lot of issues for mums and dads around libraries mm. and what children can do there safely, how much supervision mm. there is, and things. But that's part of that thing, isn't it? That yep. where the school, like you say, the school and the public library, because I don't have a background in public libraries, is that public libraries are the most amazing source of free babysitting for after school oh, care. Yeah, let's yeah. Have and start that conversation. But the <laughs> libraries in that respect would be good to have that feed in with the school libraries. So at least 
possibly these poor kids who've got nowhere else to go have a, possibly a bit of direction or help yeah. from the, you know, if they notice them sitting there on the internet. So we have yeah. some do that local schools that actually don't have a library. We are a peer library, so our public library is the school library as well. Um, but just taking it right back a step, one of the biggest challenges for us as a public library is still the cost of providing access. Um, you mentioned bandwidth yep. earlier. You know, we're still in the um, space where we have to charge for internet access and right. we still charge to use Wi-Fi in our facilities. So that's so a that's whole challenge straight away. Yep. Um, we're starting to have students come up well, we have lots of students coming after mm. school, but now if they want to bring their own device and they want to do things, it's like, okay, how are we going to manage this? Mm -hmm. um, how do we go about giving them access yeah. when our, our current policy is that Wi-Fi is a chargeable um, service? So tricky, isn't that's it? a real challenge for us. Yeah. At and I mean, how do we how do we get past that idea of equity of access? If you can, if, mm. if your family can't afford to provide the access at home, and it's charged for at whatever public facility you might go to, how do we balance that? Because we've got the haves and the have-nots immediately. And we're in the same boat. Yeah, but we don't have Wi-Fi as a paid internet service, and we're a public library. Right. Do you charge them if they plug in their power adapters into the wall? Don't give them ideas. No, right? no, it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's the whole thing about charge, public libraries. We are a um, we're a department of council. We have, we have to generate a certain amount of our revenue. We revenue to generate sorry, a certain amount of our operating costs. Very very few ways a public library can do that. Internet yeah. access is one of them. Yeah. So it's. It's, we're stuck between that rock and the hard place. It's our job to provide access, but it's, but, but the we, council needs to be self-sustaining. And while money. they're paying for it, they're entitled to a, a, some sort of service Correct. and to be allowed to go with just about money. where they want. Whereas mm -hmm. if we give it free, do we then start limiting what they can mm -hmm. do with it? That's well, another big question. Which is they're yep. going to put them off. <clears throat> so you, you're not coming to the library, they yep. get on, discover that they can't do what they want to do and then leave. Absolutely. So, I mean, I can't, I can't pretend that I have the answers, but maybe collectively we yeah. can come up with some, some thoughts about that and roll on the day that internet becomes one of those options that people regard as much of a right as just breathing and we no longer see it as an option to charge for it. Yeah. And I guess we're getting there. It's probably not as quickly as any of us would like. But yeah, the equity issue is huge for people. I think there's, a, there's yeah. another layer too. So if you've got children who have parents who are active in teaching them about um, engagement and mm -hmm. participation, and then they're coming to school and they might be interacting with children that haven't had that, there's peer-to-peer -peer learning going on there without any guidance or filtering. So you've got that going on as well. So then they'll come into, or potentially come into different areas to get access, mm -hmm. and they've got a whole heap of different viewpoints that they're trying to deal with as a small person yep. on their own. And so when they go home and they might want to have a, a talk with their, the adult in their particular family group, the, that adult may not be able to help them because they haven't got access. So, yeah, what was our solution? Did we have one? Well, I'm not sure what the solution is, but I mean, that, that's as much of a risk for a young person stepping into this type of engagement as it is for, you know, and it's part of their learning as well. Well, it is, and I guess it's, it's um, as much at, it, it's that sort of like the behind the bite sheets talk, that some of the information that your friends gave you back in, I'll probably go back in my day when I didn't have to worry about the digital footprint when I was at school, um, was equally suspect, but maybe the consequences were far less dire and immediate. So, so I think there's perhaps for me there's a sense of urgency around addressing some of these issues because it's going very quickly. Um, I think the, the parent education, the adult education, is paramount. It's almost yeah, yeah it's, it's almost like um, I just when you were talking then. I'm sorry, I sorry to interrupt, but I, but I just all of a sudden saw the like the ghost chip advertising. You know, it's almost yeah. like there needs to be 
some sort of national campaign around this. Um, yeah. But then again, is it the right time to do it when you've still got such a large proportion of the population who are not connected, who actually wouldn't wouldn't notice a campaign happening because they don't? They're talking, it's talking about stuff that for a lot of I'm thinking of some of um, Linda said about the adults and families who actually wouldn't grasp what the issue is because they had no idea of what it is that the kids are actually doing. I was I was in yeah. the UK earlier this year mm -hmm. and they have adverts on the TV that just mm -hmm. talk to you about changing your password to look after mm -hmm. you. Yeah, public service sort of yeah. 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 And it, there's yeah. no particular company it belongs to, it's just mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. messages. Mm -hmm. I mean I think that actually that the idea of the campaign is a really good one maybe it's over an extended period because I mean, for any of us we only receive the message at the time that it's right for us mm. and so we need to keep repeating which is and why I see yeah. campaign yeah. Not, not, a, not a one off, off. Yeah. 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 absolutely but that's how it's sorry <laughs> that's right. it's, it's about accessibility mm. um, yeah. in, in New Zealand to access internet is very expensive compared yeah. to yeah. other yeah. countries yeah. Yeah. there's a monopoly here that if we're aiming at campaign I mean Part of the base of the campaign should start yeah. here. Um, yep. I mean, another country in the world is so mobile, you know, it's very connected in Asia and, and in developing yep. countries because oh. their internet is, their Wi Fi <laughs> is so much uh, less expensive than what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a good point because that's what I was going to say. <laughs> why, why is it not possible that you can have free, free Wi Fi? Like, is that, is that probably one of your things that you need to do? We've got with free Wi-Fi. I mean, it's... So some have and some, have, some don't. Why can't you look at it as an, on a national level, free Wi-Fi? Like, that's, you know, that's probably your foundation. That seems like the foundation, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, that seems like the foundation. I can, I can answer No, just free Wi-Fi, but consistent. Yeah, consistent Wi-Fi. That's our problem, consistent. It seems yeah. to me that, you know, you've got free Wi-Fi, Wellington in the spots, and... Yep. here and there, but why can't you just have a holistic, consistent, good Wi-Fi, and then that's your foundation for it. You it's a great foundation. Oh, no, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, two stories from, from our, our library's got quite a big footprint with Wi-Fi. So we can close the doors, and in the summer we've got people spread all yeah. around the periphery of the library. Yeah. And we're a settlement uh, town for refugees, so we worked with a young Afghan woman um, who's quite physically disabled from an injury she sustained. And I dragged all of the management team out because she brought her family, she brought a picnic blanket, she brought her friend. They were outside using devices. We then tried to bring that group inside to actually participate in programs. And we're slowly getting them. And so, you know, the next iteration of that was working with them to actually help them generate some income for themselves through using the sewing machines that we've had and teaching that the internet can provide them with sewing patterns and with other things. And so we bring the children in as well and we start them off on that journey with within earshot and sight lines of the mums. And another heartbreaking story of the day, I mean, the office, our offices are open to the public. Had two little boys come in and they come in regularly and they plump down and I said, what are you doing? And they said, I'm bored. And I said, well, come on, we'll go down and look at the 3D printing. The first thing out of his mouth was, will this cost me anything? His mum doesn't have any money. And I said, no, well, come on, we'll go down. And then we got them looking at that. And then Minecraft. And he's, and I said, come on, we'll get your tablet. And he goes, the next thing, will this cost me anything? And it's just heartbreaking. You know, it's two crazily inquisitive kids. Who, one who wants to be an aeronautical engineer. How do we actually facilitate that journey anywhere they walk into? So there's just nothing in the way. And then that takes it to the other bit. Linda's just talked about a whole pile of facility or resources that we have. How many other libraries not only charge for internet but actually don't have all that stuff as well? We're only just really starting to get stuff that we can use. You looked like you had... Uh, no, no, I'm just saying it's... I mean, I, I... This is going to be depressing, but I just want to... Right. You know, this, there's, yep. there is no universal expectation that Wi-Fi... Of, it should be available as a public resource for mm -hmm. young people in New Zealand. What a shame. What a, what a terrible shame for anybody. And I was just thinking, going back to what Colin uh, McDonald said this morning about how the IT sector is changing 
beyond belief. And I just want to bring up something which is about the speed of that change and therefore the dire situation that we find ourselves in, which is that um, the Internet of Things is one of the huge things which is having, an, which is going to have. So it's about big data, but it's also about connected devices of all kinds. Um, throughout the world, um, most governments have put some policy money into how is that going to impact our ability to govern? How is it going to impact the safety of people online? How is it going to impact the public policy that we need to make in order to implement the Internet of Things in our jurisdiction safely? In the UK, they've just put £40 million into that effort. Internationally, there are millions and millions of dollars being spent, not by the corporates, but by government. In New Zealand, Nothing, nothing for that effort, as far as I'm aware. And I've looked on the, I've looked on all of the government websites that you might imagine that Internet of Things would be referenced. And it's in, in the only place it's referenced is in, I think, MB, where it's pr proposed as a, as a, as a, a, an entrepreneurial opportunity, but nothing to do with how we are as citizens. You know, there, there, there are a few words to say quite how dire a situation we're in on some of these issues. Slightly depressing, but actually a really good point. And we do need to draw to a close, and you're allowed to escape just to one of my other friends. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect timing. Well, that might be the last time you say it. With more people rather than... Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Kimmy, we should get together since I work across your area. Absolutely. Um, issues. I'm just going to. Um, I know. Big issue. You're leaving us a present. I'm oh. leaving you a present. Yeah. Thank you. Scoop with that And some. And um. Oh, okay. Right. I don't know if you know them, but you do. But I've heard of. That's a start. Sort of future of news, really. That, yep. You know, in that they're locally owned, okay. locally owned um, community interest rather than corporate interest. Mm -hmm. um, they pr they publish press releases, so they publish press releases, and, and, and they don't do so much journalism. But basically, if you're an NGO, okay. you can have a press release published, and that means that they've got this sort of 16 years of incredible yeah. uh, resources. Uh, they need some money, like all the media does, to keep going. Okay, so this is our this is our big question at the moment. I have another one. Actually, that might be slightly friendly for people. I'm hopeful for a volunteer to be a note taker. My writing's atrocious. I can do it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm working with um, I'm working with atrocious writing and invented spelling. So okay, all right. So this is a very um, very accepting table. <laughs> okay, one of the question that we started with in the last round was this whole idea of what challenges the libraries that you work in are facing in terms of providing digital access and I'm thinking particularly about students and young people so my market group is age 5 to about 18 in primary and secondary schools but also how we're growing um, users understanding of, digital, of their digital rights and their responsibilities because it's one thing to have access but it's an entirely other matter to know what you can use and what you can use legally when you need to when you need to ask first, when you can simply pop a citation. And that conceptually that's a that's a really big journey for students to make. Hard hard things to discover and lots of conversations with fairly small people about what well, if it's on the internet, they must have put it there for me to use. Mm. Which on a very simplistic level I can see how you how you get to that. But it's understanding that using someone's work without permission is the same as me taking one of their drawings and then popping it onto my blog and saying, it's mine. 
So it's a, it's a, I think it's a challenging time. So I'll throw the question out there. What are the challenges that you see for your libraries? Well, um, so I work for Digital New Zealand, so we kind of work across lots of libraries and glam institutions. And um, one of the things that we're really yeah, focused on is making it really easy for people to find reusable material using the filter system on Digital NZ. Um, but yeah, one of the challenges, I guess, is just there's such a variety of different um, usage statements out there. I completely understand when people are confused about what they can and can't do because there's just a, such a myriad of messaging. Um, it's very hard to, um, and this is part of our work, is mapping all these statements into a, into a shared schema. Um, it's very tricky to, yeah, to kind of communicate um, something very succinctly when there's like seven different messages on a on a site that say what you can and can't do. So, yeah, absolutely, and most of them not written in a language that even the majority of school students can actually grapple yeah. with. Yeah. I struggle myself. How many of us actually give up after we read some of the terms and conditions? Yeah. I think a big challenge we face. Um, that all libraries face, I'm sure, we certainly are aware of it, is that only a small proportion of our community comes into the library. And so the customer service model doesn't work for us because most of our community isn't a customer. So it's the challenge is really finding ways to reach way beyond the walls of the library to um, enable um, digital literacy access so what sort of ways might have you explored for doing that? So um, we think that it's key to um, segment the community um, and not try and do a one size fits all. So we're working with um, particularly school aged children or families with school aged children that don't have access to the internet. There are 1,009 of those households in our town. And so we're developing um, programs that can reach those groups. And the best way to engage with them is through schools. And so there are actually a lot of agencies that are already working on digital citizenship and doing a lot more than libraries are. And so we've heard a lot about libraries' role, but actually other agencies are doing a lot more, and it's about how do we plug in and add value and play a coordinating and facilitating role between those different agencies. And that's the only way that we can really make a dent in the problem. I would agree with that. Um, I'm a public, public library and have been in public libraries for all of my career. And I think my, my experience is, especially tweenies, mm -hmm. you know, that when they come in after school, they don't want, we've got free Wi Fi and free internet access, but they're not interested. They just want to be seen and be with each other. Yes. So it's that social so it's the social yeah. thing. And, um, you know, just recently we've had some not so good ones. Um, Incidents happening out and about in the library, and the police have sort of said, Well, if you got rid of the Wi Fi, and I said, Well, I'd actually argue the point because the kids are, I'm not even saying they have phones, they've got phones, but when they come to the library after school, it's to chill out, hang out, bug us, bite us. But yeah, so uh, um, that's, that's exactly right. It's the other agencies, and I think during school time, they're probably well and truly engaged, but after school, we're not seeing them. Okay. It's interesting what you said about the Wi Fi because uh, police in South Auckland have asked that we switch off Wi Fi after hours. Really? Yes. So to stop that lurking around the outside of the building? Yes, I mean, there's a lot of. Well, it's a bit of a debate, I guess. Um, there is crime that happens around the libraries because, well, partly because the Wi-Fi is the meeting spot, and that's where you can set up a lot of. I mean, there's quite a few drug deals that go. There's quite a few sex type deals that go. Is that the digital commerce part of digital? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's actually quite interesting. The whole, In a very broad way. <laughs> the point is really interesting because. Yep. Um, on the one hand, they're saying, all oh, these kids aren't digitally literate, they're not using digital, but they are. Yep. They're just not using it in the ways that we want them to use it. Yeah. Yeah. And begs the question, I mean, are we sort of imposing pre-digital 
ways of thinking and structures on a digital world suddenly. And saying, oh, I know, you've got to do it the way we want you to do it. Yeah, and I think it connects to what David was saying when in your intro a bit about the ethics of these yeah. things. And there, I think there is a role, like an importance of a, sort of embedding a kind of ethics in that behaviour. But not in, as you're suggesting, maybe a kind of restrictive sort of thing. Like you, you can only go to the sites that I see sure. and you can't go to the place where you know and blah, blah, blah. But there is, there is some important questions. Well, I, th- I think there are, so it's some of that question about, uh, well, probably the statement I was making that actually we want to see students online and we want them to see them engaging, and I'm going to say appropriately, so that footprint is something that when they're 20, 30, 40 or 50, they don't look back and go, oh, because it doesn't go away. So it, it's finding a way to um, encourage that, I'm going to call it appropriate online behaviour, for lack of a better term at the moment. Um, I'd suggest that all of us have a role in that, actually just in terms of modelling in terms of the way that we interact online, the way we interact using social media. I've spoken to a school recently who said that one of the, the greatest pushes in this area was to make sure that all the staff had, set, had themselves set up with their own personal learning network so that they were using Twitter and Facebook and they were modelling that appropriate use rather than, rather than the, the let's ban it or let's not to, to start to look at the more positive spin on it. How can we show how to get the best out of it? Because that's what we want. We want, we want all of these students to turn into grown-ups who can use the, the technology to just participate fully as a community member. Mm. This end of the table. We've been mm. talking <laughs> flat out. Yeah. Well, I suppose my um, involvement with students is quite limited um, because the Tasmanian Public Library Network sits within the Education Department um, but um, so we don't deliver any services directly to the student population they come to us as members of the public if you like Um, so we have a sort of slightly different relationship perhaps Um, I was trying to. Th- I was thinking what you were saying then about sort of modelling good behaviour and thinking, you know, it doesn't matter how much modelling you do, people will still find ways to misbehave. Absolutely. Um, but I think I think you're right in saying that um, the mistakes that people might make are probably going to have a much longer life than the mistakes that were made in the pre-digital world. Yep. Um, and trying to get people to understand that. I think is a big job and I was reflecting then on something that happened with my son who is now 33 I think anyway he's over 30 he's old enough to know better Hmm. and um, he recently had quite a a serious um, spat with his girlfriend as a result of some idle chit chat that happened on Facebook right and Hopefully he learned a lesson from that. But um, I think it is very very easy for people to um, see it as a very personal channel of communication without understanding how quickly it goes beyond the person. And how uh, prevalent it is. Yes. Because once something's out there... Yes. Mm. It's not easy to get it. Not only is it not easy yeah. to get it back, in some cases we don't give it back. We can't. So yes. with legal yeah. deposit and all that copyright stuff, Correct. we yes. now have the whole takedown issue where people are trying yes. to rewrite history yes. mm-hmm. and have their name taken out of various Look things because they don't like that being out there. Yes. You know, at one time it was just in a book or in a, an archive yes. somewhere in a box and it didn't matter. Nobody yep. knew. Nobody knew. But now it's out there because th- this question sort of. It's not just digital rights and responsibility, it's the whole copyright the issue, whole really. Issue. It, that's yeah. not getting any simpler. No, it yeah. isn't. Yeah, so that, that covers, that's not just kids, that's the whole... Oh, world. that's all of us. And I mean, I'm guessing that many of you have come across the, um, the YouTube clip about the poor soul from the States who inadvertently, well, unwisely, I would suggest, tweeted inappropriately about going to, now I can't think, some African nation. Oh, that's right, yes. Yeah. Yes, I do remember that one. And there. That was just a, an, a, an appalling situation where an, 
a very not carefully thought out tweet. Mm. Absolutely ruined her. Yes. Lost to her She's job. Been and yeah. Absolutely. And it all happened while she was in flight and could do nothing. Mm. I mean, she couldn't have taken it back anyway, but it was totally outside of it. took on a life of its own. Mm. So it, um, yeah, I've lost the thread of where that was going. Well, I, I think it's just trying to get people to be careful about what they put up. Absolutely. There. And that seems to me to be the bottom line. Mm. And getting yeah. that message across, I think that's part of the problem. I think that's the hardest yes. thing. Because, yeah, Jenna, go on. It's hard with the modelling because the internet is obviously so, seems the NAF same, so massive. It's kind of like we can model good behaviour if you're having direct connection with your kids mm-hmm. or your, your whanau or whatever. But then if you go to any news website and look at the go to the comment section, it's just all these people behaving like monsters. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really hard to control you know, what people see. It is hard. Yeah. And we, we talked in the previous group about even the difficulty with um, students talking one to another. And this one, who maybe has some very clear boundaries and instructions from home and school, with another person who doesn't doesn't have the same values, we'll call them. Um, how does that work? And it's a bit like that. Well, I was saying, saying it's a little bit like the information people might have shared behind the black sheets with yes. my pre-digital age. The, the it was pretty yeah. suspect, <laughs> some of it, but. It's just a bit more in your face. Now. It's a bit more in your face, and there's a permanence that it's really hard to um, to teach students about about that permanence of what we do online. It's not going away. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I don't mean to be <laughs> just just thinking about that. So yeah. part of the problem with the permanence is that we, as a pre-digital, as primary pre-digital yep. cultures, don't think that permanence is a bad thing. Or that it's a worrisome thing. But mm-hmm. for instance, I think even just in my peer group, um, we're on Twitter a lot, and we, there's a lot of stuff we share. I don't share a lot of stuff on Facebook because my parents on Facebook. Um, however, if that's permanent and it's being archived by the mm-hmm. Library of Congress, thank you very much. But we don't we don't judge each other on that. And I guess my question is. Is the problem that we're going from this transition of we're in a transitory phase between a pre-digital and a digital world? Yeah, and by the time these kids grow up, they're not going to care that you talked about this stuff. Yeah. It's not going to now it affects the employment. It does. Yeah, absolutely, it now does. it does. Mm. But in ten years, will it? Maybe. I mean, maybe, maybe our social norms around those things will, will change. change. Yeah, that's thank you. Yeah, yeah that's that's exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll put it so succinctly. Thank you. That's right. Yeah, and I mean, we are evolving all the time. What was, what would have made my grandmother go? Um, we now are more accepting of. So I think I think our social norms are changing. Quite whether they're keeping up with. Well, I, I mean, I guess there's always going to be behaviour. That's part of an evolving society, isn't it? There will always be something that's on the fringe that makes us go. Is that okay? But for me, the biggest challenge is how we set our set children and young people up to deal with that mm-hmm. and probably how we actually support parents as well, both through school and public life. Mm-hmm. 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 I see. Um, so I don't know what, whether any of you have experiences that you could share about maybe work that you do with parent communities in terms of growing that digital confidence as well, that understanding. I'm with the State Library, and mm-hmm. like Jenny, we don't have, although we are starting to ramp up our programming but very early days. Some of our um, contact with various age groups is through a particular service, and there was talk in the other group about family history. Mm-hmm. So we tend to focus on those people because they come along and they want to use our machines, yep. so they get. But that's it's not a deliberate effort to ramp up their literacy, it's just that they need those skills to access. So that's been most of our experience. Well, that's great, isn't it? Just what we'd, I'd be calling just in time learning, because well, that's it right is, when they need indeed. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we don't go out there, well, not yet. It's something we're discussing, which is part of why I'm here, um, you know, about whether we do need to be more proactive in that space. And what is the role of a state library in that? And as opposed to a public library or not opposed, we're all just libraries is the other side. Well, that was the question of the previous group, are we the the one big library? Indeed, yeah, and I come from a public library background, so I've kind of got a foot in both camps. 
Jane. Uh, was it from Wellington? I'm just thinking, really, because um, I'm slightly removed from it at the moment, but I'm um, just trying to, to think about with the sort of teenage years, mm-hmm. we don't tend to work with them, but not in the same, not in this area. It's made me think um, about this quite a lot. With the younger ones, the first messages are coming through really right from the tiny ones now. We're giving some messages out about it because um, the work that we're doing with them far more actively with the schools and things. Yep. But uh, not in a formal way, but it's just sort of letting... It's incidental, certain... I guess, mm-hmm. as part of it. Yes. Yeah. And trying to get that through. Is that the key? It's, is that that traditional thing where you got to get him from north to seven? Like, you know, what do the Jesuits say? Give him boy until he's seven, seven or give him about the man. man. I mean, yep. that seems to be the key that whatever we're trying to do to get through really deal with the better essential. Well, I, yep, I would agree with that. I think, I think the hardest thing in any of this, and I'm certainly one of these people who's transitioned into the digital after a long time not... Um, is making yeah, we're a all shift. retrofitted, we're, we're, so we're to speak. Retrofitted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 that's great. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That can be my next way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> absolutely. And even though I've, I've heard people talk about visitors and residents in terms, you know, rather than natives and, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, but I, I think it is earlier the better, but and earlier and incidental. So it's part of, it's that idea of authentic learning. It's when the student needs it. What we've always known about reading Correct. and writing, mm-hmm. the earlier they learn those skills, the better, just yep. extend it a bit and it's the digital. Yep. Absolutely right. The, dif- the yep. difference with reading and writing though is that once you learnt the basics, it was just a question they of don't practice. Change it, do they? But <laughs> I think now technology is, you know, devices, applications, platforms are changing all the time and a lot of it is really being driven by the market wanting to sell more things. The, the level of add-ons and capabilities that it gives you are probably of interest to a fairly small section of the population. So trying to sift through all of that to see, well, what are the key differences that are going to affect my ability to communicate and learn and find things out. I think that's really, really challenging. That's true. So maybe rather, sorry, maybe no, rather no. than it was how to write an S and an R and yep. one, two, three, four, yeah. now it's more an attitudinal thing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you know, that, that you learn to play, as we were talking yeah. about the other yeah. group, to, to be feel free to play, yep. intuitive, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's that, that experiential sort of learning. You learn by doing rather than, than being taught, and that and that's just growing and growing mm. and, and using young people as our, our guides and mentors. I do believe it's time we have to move Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Yes, thank you. Thank you. See you again. That's all right. Don't think think we're checking you in and out. That's all right. I'm sure we've got a. We've got got this one underneath that. It is a sneaky face to see. Did you do that deliberately, Linda? Of course I did. How did you know? Just thinking, because I've been sitting here thinking this was not a sneaky place to sit. But that's okay. Now I'm feeling a little lonely on this side of the table. (laughs) You've hit the jackpot position in that you are immediately in front of both the paper and the pen. Are you comfortable with that? (laughs) I'm delighted. Delighted? Go on, delighted. That is fabulous. There's nothing like it. Oh, hello. Hello. A delighted note taker. Yes. Oh, Oh, very good. Works to my (laughs) strengths. That's perfect. (laughs) I'm illiterate. Okay. So let's get going. You've met me already and you know a little bit about me. I work with our predominantly teachers and students age 5 to 18. So that, that's the sort of lens I look at this whole issue with. What we've been addressing is this big question about the challenges that your library faces in terms of providing digital access and growing users' understanding of digital rights and responsibilities. 
So anyone who'd like to kickstart that an answer to that question, I would be delighted. I don't know whether I should let you look at the previous groups. I'm just going to hide them. Except for those that are green outside there. That's right. So, what are the challenges? I think space. Space, so yep. for the physical... Physical, yeah. Yep, okay. For some of it. Uh, I mean, my example is I work in a... Just had our 40th anniversary of our building. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed for the years. Right, so we're fitting a 21st century set of services into a less than 21st century space. Is that? Is that yeah. Yep. So there's some physical constraints around what can happen. Okay, let's have some additions to that. Could be the physical, might be other other issues. What are the challenges that your libraries might face? Or do face staff. cultural staff and cultural. Mm -hmm. Would you like to give me a little bit more detail about your cultural ideas? Mm, so language barriers <coughs> or uh, <coughs> staff that reflect their own culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that at all. <laughs> <laughs> language, the language, language. Well, well, well. <laughs> That's all right. You can use your outside voice. <laughs> 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 Okay. Do you? Oh, am I allowed to ask a question? Oh, yes, of course else? you may. <laughs> I, don't, I, just, I don't have a talking stick. Right. Okay, right. So, you might I was just thinking in terms play. of when you were saying about cultural, and obviously there's yep. a language thing, but I, I'm wondering too the cultural dimension of different understandings of things like the use of information. So mm. that question that you talked about, rights and responsibilities. Yep. Um, where the people experience with young people that they've come in with a different idea about what's okay to do, yeah. um, things around plagiarism, oh. things about um, behaviour, those sorts of things as well. You've also got that cultural thing of um, what a different culture or the family group yeah. actually considers as appropriate yeah. for yeah. What that person to look at too. Mm -hmm. yep. so, so it's the family norm as well as... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. as well as the group, the group norms. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would just like to say that I think that the um, technological revolution we're living in uh, the, the first gentleman who spoke, I think, he mentioned about time, how fast everything is moving. I, I mean, we, we sit here and perhaps mention about space and small space. I think the technological revolution is cutting through all of that. There's this tremendous connection between the human mind and technology, both visual as well as literal words and all the rest of it. And I think, I think trying to stop and figure out things like rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. is, is um, it's way past that already. We're already past that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, what comes to my mind are the, film, the films The Librarian. Now, I think my grandsons would have far greater um, a sense of a library from the films what a library might be on, on the adventure of life mm -hmm. from those films and that amazing technology then from then from going down the corner library and knowing that the people there are very well meaning but are thinking about rights and responsibilities. Just I really do. I, I, I think we, we need to keep up a little bit with what's already yeah. there yeah. and what children are exposed to and accessing. They go to the video store and can get these sorts of uh, stories and, and books and whatever. Heaps and heaps of things. They, right. they yep. play games. They have the crazy Russian hacker. But, yeah. but doesn't, but that therefore mean, doesn't that therefore mean that need to be focusing on ability to discriminate. And Absolutely. You know, yeah. Exactly. Mm. I mean, yes, isn't that, that, that's that just part of it? Yes. Mm. I think so. Right. Well, my feeling is, is you do not, by talking about rights and responsibilities and behaving well, 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 you wouldn't talk to them about it. I, 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 I don't think that that is necessarily 
going to yeah. um, brush off. You know, I think you'll just have exactly what we've got now, which is some people do it, some people don't. I think, I think, but, that, but I think if it's built in, I mean, I think stuff. that is well, what I'm picking up from what you're the subtext of what you're sort of saying, subtext. maybe, is that if you're intentional within a learning context, That's if right, you build it in intentionally, you scaffold it in, just yes. like you are learning other skills and other Absolutely. norms, Any yeah. human. then rather than leaving it to chance, I, I think well, we if don't you leave, leave it to chance, we have education. No, but, um, we, but well, that is but, the point. I think the point, the point yeah. is that it is being left to chance mm. in many yeah. situations. I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that it's no more left to chance than it's ever been. It's the, the new technology is just so amazing and overwhelming. It is also applying to human minds in ways we've never had before. I mean, in, I wish you wouldn't have that thing going. <laughs> um, the, the, I, I think of technology in terms of, while this is about more uh, literal, literacy, I'm thinking in terms of Mandelbrot in the 70s mm -hmm. came up with the idea of fractals mm -hmm. and look what we have now. Mm -hmm. I mean on my cell phone, and I'm 70 years old, I can click on and I can see mm -hmm. another part of the world. Yeah. I have the European Space Agency tell me what's happening in space. So I mean, This is yeah, part of my ordinary every day. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and now, this sets now you. think no no, no, no. <laughs> that's and I haven't been taught. I, I, this is this is the world that I'm living in now. I can access not only my library. I can access space. But you, yeah. you also yeah. have I can years access. of being discriminated oh, so before this technology. You've, you've brought quite no, a no, lot no. of experience as well. <laughs> I think, yeah. if we can just, just slide back to this no, no, the student but we must, yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, students nowadays have <laughs> metal, what they have fractals, we have LADA, LADA, LADA there in the library. Just go and look at the film yeah, yeah. that's showing there and you can, you can see New Zealand from all kinds of angles. You can, you know, they can. I think it's there's no amazing. question that there is. I you mean, don't no need to have tr checks and balances. Uh, well, I think that, that is. Input. I mean, I think there's some, there is interesting research that shows that many young people are quite overwhelmed. In fact, if they're trying to do things like research because of the incredible wealth, there's no shortage of information and data and apps and everything. Absolutely. It's more about how they are able to have a real sense of mastery and purpose and focus That's when they are. Always been to, so. That's what yes, but it is more for. acute. It is more acute, and I think the stakes are higher. Um, the point is, <laughs> I'll capture what, what you're saying. Um, you've got literacy skills, you've got digital literacy skills, and that is the information literacy skills. And that is what, what should be happening at schools. If it doesn't happen at schools, it is our job to address that in the library. And I, mean, I think it's fair to say that it is happening in schools, it's happening in, to varying degrees. degrees yes. And um, students, as with all of us, it's about, it is about just-in-time learning. It's when the, when the moment is right for you, yeah. then, then there's a time to, to develop some of these skills, to use some of those evaluative and critical thinking skills that probably some of you have talked with Andrew about. But there's a whole group of have-not students as well. And much as I'd like to say they weren't, there are students who simply don't have those that range of experiences in their home environment, and for whatever reason, their experience in school is sometimes quite patchy as well. And I guess my question is around how the school, the public library, the national library and communities can work together to address some of that imbalance because we need all of our citizens set up mm. to participate fully and that's, a, that's around the haves and the have nots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. I, 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 I'm, I'm really listening to what you're saying and I'm thinking about the experiences I've had as a librarian and thinking about some of the services we offer. Mm -hmm. uh, we run a service called Any Questions which is a virtual reference service where students come on board and ask their questions. Mm -hmm. What's happening there is there is a lot of information 
they are looking for support. They are initiating mm. the request for support to find the valuable information that's going to help them answer the question that they've got. So I think the concept here is not that we own it and we're, you know, we're mm. um, we're in charge of that, and you will sit there and you will learn. It's Absolutely. still the student or the employer or the adult, whoever it is that's looking looking for some information on something, we are there to sit alongside and help. And that request for help comes from the individual. Our operators often get asked, are you a person or are you a machine? <laughs> you know, they want to know that they are actually sharing that with new person, experience person. with the person. Yep. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, it is kind of like it's a parent's responsibility. It is your, you're kind of one of those enabling adults to support a learner to explore and discover. It's not about controlling that experience. It's not about ownership of it. That belongs to the inquirer. That belongs to the person seeking the information. And I think it's that. Bit. I think we can't be proselytising. You know, we are in this process, and we've got to change all these people. Make sure that they are. You know, they've got to be done good. You know, we're going to do good. To, yeah. You know. So I think it's the kind of the frame that you come into that explanation with that's really important. And I think what you're talking about is you. You know, there's this wonderful world to explore of information. It's all there, and you absolutely right. People go and do what they want with it. But at that time um, when they're hmm. looking for when they're I, I looking think the technology is actually affecting the human mind in ways that we has never yeah. happened yeah. before. Sure. Yes. And, yes. and yes. the young people yeah. get it. I mean, it you know, there's, a, there's a sense where they don't need to be carefully trained to be literate because with the way we can deal with imagery, they get it like that. It and is, I'm talking yeah. even moral lessons, I'm talking all of that sort of thing. They get it. It is interesting, though, just to pick up on what Geraldine was saying, one of the things that we have found, in fact, I think we've probably been surprised that the particular service that uh, you're talking about has continued to grow in strength. It is completely initiated by these young people who are prepared to wait up to half an hour on chat to get a human (laughs) to help them to find information. I'm not saying not humans. I'm I'm saying what the humans are doing. But but it's interesting that they are not seeing, they themselves clearly do not feel that they have the level of uh, co- they do not feel that has the level of skill that they need to really discern the best information for their question, and so they are they are, it's not they're not being told to go and do this. No, They'll do it from home of their own debate. Yeah, Socrates they want said to help. that the best way to learn is to ask questions, that's right. and that's what children do. Yeah, that's right. That's yes. exactly my, my point, and the point I often make to counsellors when I have to put forward cases for money etc is that when they come to the library they've done the google and they need somebody to hold a hand and support them and that's exactly what what any questions yeah it's doing yeah it's that's all right but there's time for turns it's also about not just providing access to information and kids finding information, it's also about what information they put out there themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's yes. kind of the other yes. side of the conversation. Mm-hmm. And and there I think they do need education. They need mm-hmm. to know Absolutely. about the consequences of putting themselves out there on the web. And and that's I, I don't work in it children, but I have children and it's working out what is age appropriate, at what point do you mm-hmm. yeah. introduce these new skills? And, and they're not just going to find them out by themselves. They, they need guidance, just like they do in growing up. And some, of, um, and some of that is around, um, we talked in the previous group about really some of it's around social norms, what, what's yeah. acceptable behaviour around mm. the table face-to-face online and people question was raised, do we think those social norms are going to change so that what is currently maybe unacceptable online becomes accepted behaviour. So there were some some interesting things to think about. But right now we need to be, I I believe we actually need to be modelling as adults what um, what's active and appropriate participation in the online environment. 
because otherwise how do you know? It's like assuming that because children have grown up with motor vehicles around them, that they will automatically understand how to operate safely, how to drive, how to cross the road. We still osmosis. need to do, yeah, mm. somehow mm. it happens. I think a lot of us adults are still working that out that's, for ourselves. That's a challenge. Mm. Yes, we and are. that's, it's trying to yeah. keep that step ahead or at least only one step yeah. behind. Or even side by side would be good sometimes. Yeah. Wouldn't it? But, yeah. So that's, um, that's the challenge to work out the progress that you can teach. Mm. Looking around at other people. Oh, can I just ask about um, oh, some of the librarians? Um, can I ask two, two questions? Just throw it generally. You talk about libraries, you, talk, you think about working collaboratively with other sorts of cultural institutions such as museums, different ways of providing engagement, learning. Absolutely, why not? Yeah. Yes, so I haven't heard, heard, heard We just haven't said that, have we? Yeah. Um, and the second question to, to throw it open was um, that the concept of um, you seem to be saying that information out there is tons of it and it's good or you need to learn to discriminate. There's a concept of information basically being um, so monetised and marketed it's actually grabbing your attention all the time. Mm -hmm. Is it also teaching kids how to, in some respects, resist that grabbing your attention? So, so you know, that, that, that monetization of, of your, the, the attention, the focus and the concentration mm -hmm. that you have. So is that some way yeah. that you guys are... I think that it is. I mean, yeah. I think if I'm just well, going to refer back to this document. The authenticity no, of the data is actually saying, do you, you know, oh, yeah. can you learn how to, to not, to well, not, not to be a, a yeah. kind of constant consumer? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of it's that digital health and wellness. It is. So when, when should I be offline? How much is too much? How do I manage it? How much is it? Yeah, exactly. And that's about, that about young people taking control. Yeah. And giving them the skills to do that. There's been some research done that's shown that when you go onto the Google page as it exists now, mm -hmm. only 18% of it is actually dealing with the results of what you're doing. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's why they've started up DuckDuckGo. It's when it has one hand and it doesn't also bring back millions of answers. It brings back a short list of some chosen resources that they want to, that they think are reputable. What's yeah. including Wikipedia? Duck, 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 duck. I think that sort of relates, in fact, to a, another thing. I think that um, there's an interesting depth about digital citizenship, slash literacy, and that is actually actively uh, teaching young people about how, you know, how do algorithms work. You know, actually getting under the hood of sort of the, the whole thing. So it's not just can you find the right information, but actually there's a whole system here. You are being that has been delivered up to you, and what that does mean it is that thing of actually just knowing if you understand that there is a way that this is being made available, you are then you can at least be a bit intentional about it and be able to critique it. it I think one of the aspects of being a digital citizen is being able to understand what you challenge, what to, you know, what's the old, what to ignore, what to believe, what to doubt, you know, what, what actually has got substance. Yeah, and that's a different thing to, can I access stuff? Yeah. It's a different whole and, and that, I think over time, we will start to realise that that is something we actually have to be quite explicit in bringing into a learning um, activity to people. Yeah. Because we're just we're kind of just passive recipients of it all. We just let it roll. Yeah. 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 Mm. There's lots of layers of understanding yeah. about yeah. how the information is being presented to us. Yeah. Um, and just find your way through that. And really, it's, I mean, I've been looking for support students to find their way through as well. And it's talking about them, the very conversations that we're having that often um, adults have just self-conversations in their head that we never actually, we don't share with students. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to share my, my dilemma actually, I was just thinking about the moral code online and I was thinking, well, you go to Call of Duty and you kill as many people as you possibly can and that's absolutely acceptable. And then you go on to Second Life and you kill someone on Second Life, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. <laughs> but how, how do you kind of explain to each other what those are different things? Well, I think I might have a discussion with your child and he was 
competing there and coming in front because you're I'm a member sure. of the right. Is it different from Cowboys and Indians? So being caught up off the shed roof because I was dead. And we come and slide the seat somewhere? I don't know, because it only dies online. Precisely, yes. It's a very big question. It's a very big question. It's a very big question.